Seems like people might be settled and maybe we can begin. So welcome everyone. Um, I think, Tony, do you wanna kick us off or did you? Uh, sure, I can kick us off or you can kick us off. Um, I mean, we just heard a great set of, uh, of flash presentations, but what we're here to talk about uh, today, um, following up on that and, and what Gavin was, was just talking about and actually Alex talked a, a little bit about as well, Alexandra, uh, but how the partnerships between universities and local communities and cities can help advance the SDGs. Uh, and so looks like we've got a great crowd of people. Um, and um, Lori, should we, do we wanna do a quick round of introductions? We've, we've, we're, we're tight on time, but uh, I'm yeah. Tony Pippa, I'm a senior fellow at the Brookings Institution, so I can just do that quickly. <laughs> yeah, um, I think yesterday in the breakout that I was in, what worked well is to just kind of direct it a little so people can say who they are and start start the conversation at the same time. So we kind of break the sound barrier and then we'll have discussion. Because if we just do normal introductions, it'll use all the time. Yeah. Um, so my name is Lori Dupree Brown. I'm from the University of Wisconsin. I work on sustainable development goals locally and globally in, in, um, in, in university partnerships and other settings. And I'm very interested in mixed methods and, and social inclusion. Saw some of you yesterday. So looking forward to continuing the conversation. I'll pass the ball to David Kay, and why don't you, everybody, pass the ball when you're done, so we skip the awkward silence. Sure, I'm David Kay. I'm a outreach faculty member at Cornell University. I'm in our Department of Global Development, and I've been one of the leads in uh, bringing Cornell and our Sustainability Institute into the uh, SDSN network, although we haven't been super active yet in it. And um, in this context, in the context of this group, I spent many years as part of Cornell's local government program and community development institutes. I spent most of my career working uh, with local governments in New York State on uh, this. And I have some thoughts later about the SDGs and what I think the theme is, but I'll pass it on to Deepa. Thank you, David. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, I'm Deepa Vedavyas. I am the Sustainability Manager at the city in the city of Cleveland, Mayor's Office of Sustainability. I'm currently working on managing a Lead for City certification process as one of the cohort cities of 2020, and also working on 100% um, uh, renewable energy and equity plan, a roadmap for 2050 targets. And I'm here and interested to learn how our local efforts can be aligned with uh, SDGs and uh, to learn more on how we can uh, uh, come up with a global narrative of uh, our local efforts. I would pass it on to Scarlett. Hi everyone, Scarlett Lanzas in Miami, Florida. I'm a founder, the founder of Accountable Impact, a social enterprise to hold entities accountable for the impact they have in their um, environment and communities. Currently working with uh, or discussing with the Miami-Dade County government to explore doing a uh, VLR for Miami. Okay. Thank you. Um, next, John Anderson. All right, perfect. Hi everyone, I'm John Anderson. I'm a professor at the University of Idaho. Uh, College of Art and Architecture. Um, I run a virtual technology lab uh, in particular that supports social ecological systems or social ecological technical systems. Uh, so decision support uh, tools that can be used to manage cities um, and for designers to use in the near future. Um, we're interested, I'll just preface slightly, um, our university is in a reformation. Um, there's strong interest in the SDGs as being the framework to create potentially an entire new college focused purely on sustainability. Um, it's a place where we bring everyone, well, all disciplines. It's the era of convergence and convergent research. And so um, I'll be reporting on a few different levels. My other sides of this is how we impact our communities. And uh, here in Northern Idaho in the Pacific Northwest, uh, those communities are also indigenous people and sovereign nations. And so how do we uh, cross that path with universities uh, and government agencies in particular and state governments uh, with sovereign nations? So I'll stop there, thank you. Great, 
Christoph, do you like to know Ned? Oh, sure. Uh, hi, everyone. My name is Christoph Strauss, um, and I'm with the University of Washington here in Seattle. And I um, am working with our sustainability office on uh, implementing our sustainability action plan and looking for ways that we can begin to integrate the SDGs into that and align some of the projects we're doing, um, particularly in the College of Built Environments uh, around um, working with the city of Seattle and working with community organizations uh, and, and the university to implement um, sustainable development goals related projects, circular economy projects, environmental justice projects. So uh, really happy to be here. I'm also a graduate student uh, employee. So I'm very happy to be here, be a part of this conversation and to learn from you all. And I'll pass it to uh, Gavin. Hey everyone, my name is Gavin Luter, Managing Director of the University Alliance, and I'm going to cut my intro short because most of you just heard about what I do all day. I'm going to pass it over to Mark. Thanks, Gavin. Hi, everybody. And uh, again, apologies that I, I'm teaching at the top of the hour, so I, I've got to make this really short, but I wanted to introduce myself and say hello to everyone. Uh, Mark Roseland, a Canadian, recently moved to Arizona State University. My field is sustainable community development. This is the last edition of my book, Towards Sustainable Communities, subtitled Solutions for Citizens and Their Governments. Uh, the fifth edition will be coming out in 2023. Um, and my work these days is mostly focused on uh, decision support tools, creating decision support tools for communities and neighborhoods to make, basically to localize the SDGs, to, to think of, of sort of the complex set of, of objectives that we have in a way where we're not doing false trade-offs, but we're finding synergies and, and getting multiple co-benefits because of thinking strategically. So uh, I will leave my email in the chat. If anybody is interested in, in uh, helping to or working with, with the objective of creating some kind of an online uh, tool to make it easier for, for communities, uh, including municipalities, but, but neighborhoods in particular, to, to have access to this kind of information to make better decisions, uh, I think there's a lot of work to be done and uh, we're definitely looking for collaborators. So thank you. And I will pass it on to whoever hasn't spoken yet. Which, uh, I think the video folks have all spoken. And so yeah. one, one thought. I don't think I, June has. June, oh, June. OK. Oh, hi. Uh, hi, hi June. My name is, hi. No problem. No problem. Hi, my name is June. And um, I'm also in Seattle. Uh, I'm with Seattle Pacific University. I'm an assistant professor uh, in uh, School of Business, Government Economics. And uh, we're in the process of um, building our uh, sustainability minor. And, and one of the things that I, I thought would be very interesting is, you know, how to engage with the community and, and, and cities and, and, you know, shape this minor program into a, a kind of an interaction program with the community. Thank you. Thank you. We have Donald Ritchie just joined us on video, which means I think you probably want to introduce yourself. I was going to make the suggestion that those who aren't on video might want to introduce themselves via chat. And so we can move toward the discussion part and, you know, hop onto the video if you want to do it orally. But um, Tony and I were going to kind of frame the question and get some interaction going. So, so far we have Donald and Ilana who can um, do it verbally and then everybody watch your chat for the online folks to introduce themselves and then we can have a little more time for discussion. Mark, you're muted. Mark, you're on mute. Sorry, my name is Mark Ritchie. I serve as president of Global Minnesota and we're a World Affairs Council in Minnesota out here on the prairie. And um, I've been working on the sustainable development goals specifically about the proposal to bring a world expo on the SDGs to Minnesota in the summer of 2027, specifically focused on SDG three. Um, but we're uh, as a state um, having, uh, I would say pretty good success with our largest companies who've been active for first with the millennial goals and the global compact with some of our institutions, the University of Minnesota has now really stepped up, but almost all of our colleges not a lot of uptake yet in the um, 
kind of state government, city government, but I would say interest and some foundations with, um, you know, in incorporating the goals as part of their um, sort of the strategic planning. And I'm looking forward to how to kick the national activities up to a higher, higher level and how Minnesota can be part of that. Great. Hi, Alana, would you like to say hello? Um, yes, yeah, sorry for being late. Um, I'm Ilona Balrich. I'm at Penn State, and I manage the Sustainable Communities Collaborative. Hi, Gavin. Um, at Penn State, it's housed in the Sustainability um, Institute, and I pair up um, community partners um, with classes to address the partner sustainability challenge. So we frame engage scholarship through the SDGs. Thanks. Great. Great. Well, our, um, I think it would be great to jump into the discussion as Lori suggested. Uh, and, you know, Gavin actually started us off a little bit with his, uh, with his lightning presentation, but really, I think what we wanted to hear from the crowd is, um, and, and to sort of frame up the discussion is, What's been a like? What are you doing in terms of engaging with the community or engaging with your city government uh, from a university perspective? What's been working about that? What's challenging about it? Um, and what what helps it work better? Uh, and um, just to share some models and and the university model that that uh, Gavin laid out is 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 one such uh, model. I think the other thing is though, and, and Laura reminded me of this as we were talking together before the session, how does this also link up with the moment, the moment that's happening in higher education, what you're facing actually uh, just in sort of the formats that you're teaching and working and, and engaging with students and other members and, and, um, and how does that also link up to the political moment, frankly, uh, that we're in right now and what the focus is. So I think those are the big questions that, uh, that were in our minds to, to sort of get the ball rolling and get the conversation going. And I know I can see everybody on the screen at once. So if you wanna do raise hand in the chat, that's fine, but can also just sort of be able to see people coming in off mute and wanting to talk. And if we can be respectful, I think we can get a little bit of a free flowing conversation going. Laura, do you wanna add on to that? I think just to just to um, you know think think creatively here and think across disciplines that, that we're here and I I think just to give some simple prompts you know what's what's working what could be better what's missing and what's possible so those are all a little different and you can answer either one I'll probably report out according to that structure so just to keep make it easy to remember so it's a version of the good bad and the ugly that includes the possible. Who has some thoughts to share? Hey, I go. I'm Thank not you. shy. <laughs> <laughs> um, I'll, I'll start with your, uh, I think, last comment, Tony, or, or question about um, where does this fit at our university? Um, I think this is such an opportune moment um, to, um, so my work in this outreach and engaged scholarship capacity, we have so much interest from faculty to do that. Um, so it's, we are really well positioned and the SDGs, um, so that would be the good. Um, you know, a lot of people, including myself, we like to have things kind of simple and they help to organize things, right? You have all these colorful boxes and you can interpret just about everything through that lens. And it makes, it makes the SDGs more approachable, right? It makes a concept that can be really complicated and hard to understand uh, more tangible almost. At least that's been my experience in working with community partners. It can help them organize work that really can seem overwhelming, right? If you go to a community and say, okay, 
you know, let's think about sustainability and climate change. And let's start, right? So where are you going to start? And, and so the SDGs really help frame that conversation and frame next steps and provide a really nice way in. Um, I work a lot in very rural communities. Penn State is located not in an urban center. Um, the bad is the stigma attached to the UN part, you know, and that's probably no surprise. So I say that very quietly and, you know, and then pull out the rest and explain it. And, you know, I, I mean, in a way it's not rocket science. So that's my perspective. I love having this opportunity to, you know, introduce new concepts in a, in a really organized manner. That's what I have to say. Thank you. Great, thanks. Yeah, Lona, I'll, I'll jump in at the, the back. Thank you for those comments, because actually you're pointing at some areas that I think we're challenged with. There's one side that, you know, just like any SES or any environment and community, this is all going to be different for each of us. So there's the best practices that we definitely have to share on engagement of SDSNs, you know, in the communities, because all of our communities, like you mentioned, are going to be different. Um, stigmas, biases of just the letters U and N, right, you know, do exist and you acknowledge it. But I don't think that it exists in the areas that I see this group for two areas. Um, SDSN within the academic realm is not questioned. And the UN isn't questioned, I would say, largely. And so for that, we can use the SDSN as that framework academically. And when I see that we're in this partnership of universities and cities, um, I'm challenged right now. And that's why I had spoke uh, briefly of us actually forming an entire new interdisciplinary college that many of you have done, many of you have tried, some have failed, some have gone in different areas, right? And there's best practices because if we're going to implement SDSN at a university level, that involves all of our disciplines, right? So the first challenge we have in academics is to see how we can create those structures to successfully survive in academics, you know, into that, right? The next one is then how do we gain the trust of our communities? You know, and I'm in Idaho where the trust of an academic community and researcher going into a rural community is, is difficult, right? And in, as I spoke on indigenous groups as well, this is a Western problem to, or, you know, a Western solution to a Western problem. Uh, there is some questions of why this new group needs to come in when there's all these other great initiatives, right? And so in some sense, education is just about the shared knowledge. And so, you know, for me, I'm kind of looking for that, that best practice right now as we form it, uh, you know, and it's going to have to have a flavor to our own selves here. Um, but I see the SDSN not necessarily as really broadcasting it into the community, because, you know, in, in my state, that's what we're doing, and I've got businesses. They're doing it, they just don't know they're doing it yet. Right. And so we capture them and get the education going. But that I, I propose that, yeah, SDSN really stays academic focused, especially within this group. Um, and then we'll get some 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 headway. But I do have support from a president and I know that's important. Right. But um, I'd like to hear more from everybody else of the pitfalls and and obstacles and, you know, and the other things that, and the positives as well. Oh, great. Thank you, John. David, I saw some comments you've been putting in the chat. Uh, around the work that you all are doing. Well, yeah, I mean, I, so I would say uh, we've been fortunate because somebody dropped a large pile of money on us a while ago mm -hmm. as an institution. Always helps. <laughs> to uh, a foundation to really up our game in terms of uh, engagement, you know, and we're a land grant institution as well as some of the other CRR. So, you know, that also helps in certain ways um uh you know the so from my perspective as someone who's been partly responsible for getting cornell involved in sdsn the question and also in my own department which is a department of global development uh the question is like it's we have a lot of things going on but the uh sdg uh framework is is not explicitly part of most of it. Now I could translate a lot of what we're doing into an SDG framework, but it's not part of the consciousness still of what most of the people even on campus are doing. And then trying to bring that into the sort of as the framework. 
And particularly in New York, I would say, which is where I do most of my work, where we have, um, you know, we have, uh, you know, climate smart communities programs. Uh, you know, I spent years working on uh, sort of community indicators projects. And what I'm trying to say is there's a lot of other sort of like accounting frameworks uh, that have been in place over many years and how do we keep track of how we're doing as a community. Yeah. And, you know, it, I haven't tried to do this yet, but uh, it would be somewhat of a hard sell, I would say, to to many places to say, hey, you know what, this SDG framework, which comes from, you know, an international, but, you know, sort of set of agreements, this yeah. is the one that you should change your practices, whatever you've got going now to pay attention to, because, you know, whereas our Climate Smart Communities framework, where they kind of have a different kind of point keeping system, really, they get they do that then you know they kind of score points with the state right. for funding and things like that so anyway that's one of the barriers i see yeah i'm here so so i think that there's like there's two related sometimes overlapping but also separate themes here so one is to john's point sort of the trust between university and community and just the potential you know the the importance of the relationship and the importance of uh, of coming together and the best practices and building that trust. And then in some respects, you've also got a complicating factor with the SDGs because especially in the US, there is a fairly low level of awareness around the SDGs. It's also in competition in some ways, the way you're talking about it, David, with other kinds of frameworks, uh, reporting requirements. Now to Alana's point, some of those actually are quite sympathetic or even a part of the SDGs. They might be a narrower subset or they might, you know, sort of work within the overall framework and umbrella of the SDGs. But, uh, but there are different things that, you know, communities have as a possibility or a way to think about uh, what progress might look like on different characteristics of, of sustainable development. And so there has to be a clear value proposition as well for the SDGs, especially for something that has a fairly low level of awareness and sometimes comes with baggage because it's, you know, it can be seen as coming from the outside or coming from the UN. Um, having said that, I think that, you know, there, and it'd be interesting to hear uh, about the work, but, you know, my, my experience is that universities, especially given their analytical and intellectual capacity, and also given the response from students as well, can get very excited about the SDGs because it is a global movement, but you're also doing something locally that fits into that. And so the connection between local and global actually is quite exciting and quite motivating. Uh, and and still allows for deep work, the, the kind of work that Gordon was talking about when they're doing work in the County of San Diego on decarbonization, which is really tough analytical work um, about what's possible. So, um, I would I was actually kind of uh, I'm going to call two people out because <laughs> uh, just because I think it'll be fun. Um, Scarlett and Deepa, you all are uh, not academic institutions and Scarlett in particular, uh, you deal with kind of broader, like holding people responsible <laughs> for the SDGs when like people might not even know that they're out there. So I don't know, I'm just kind of curious to hear you all's thoughts and reflections on this recent conversation because we're all like working at universities and you're not. So I think you're a valuable perspective for us to hear. Sure, so, <laughs> I'm seeing the VLR as a tool to really hold governments accountable, right? So in Miami, you're absolutely correct. I would say 90% of the people here, whether they're corporate leaders or government officials or students, they don't know about the SDGs, right? So for the past four years, we've been, along with another organization that I'm um, the board president for, we've been educating, raising awareness about the SDGs, right? But with that pandemic, I think it, it, it just we realized as a community, as a city, that all the structural inequalities surfaced. So they're taking more, I, I wanna say that 
the new administration here, we, we have a first, the first female mayor of the county. It's, they're just taking actions in terms of like being progressive and, and, and incorporating some of the SDG elements without even calling it SDGs, right? So for example, she created the Office for Equity and Inclusion, which never existed before. She created the Office of Community Engagement. So a report that was done in Miami-Dade County back in 2010, pre-SDGs, which was called Green Print Report. It was specifically talking about climate change, health equity, things that we were not even discussed at the UN level, right? So my work is, and they did the, so the mayor just announced that they wanna do the Green Print Report 2.0. So my work is to really capitalize on those voluntary efforts, right? Or, or those, those ideas or, or promises to capitalize and insert or adopt the SDG framework so that we can then create a voluntary local review. Um, I'm incorporating also academia. I actually have been talking to, to Tony Pipa and to Hawaii Green, Green Growth and FIU, Florida International University, the Metropolitan Center, to join in this effort. On the other hand, we are also working on an SDG impact pledge to get companies to commit to the SDGs, but not as a reg regular pledge where, where they just provide a pretty logo in a pretty website and that's it. We're actually gonna make them work in doing some assessment and baseline and incorporating some of the SDG targets and indicators in their business model. So those elements are, are the ones that we're gonna be using to hold them accountable. Thank you. Deepa, did you wanna to speak to the question that was raised? Sure, happy to. And uh, my background is from community development. I served as a director of planning and development for a nonprofit in a community. So I can speak in terms of the vocabulary and trying to relate to the uh, SDGs. It's, it, it is hard enough. What I notice is uh, working for the city now, um, trying to explain about the lead for cities uh, certification process and its alignment with our existing work and our, you know, our vision, our 100% renewable energy targets, trying to, you know, connect the dots. And when we go to outreach and engage the community, like how President, uh, you know, Frederick mentioned this afternoon, that there are many wasted efforts, you know, how as, as local government, that's our, you know, biggest fear when we present even internally, we, even though we have an office of 10 uh, staff members as a mayor's office of sustainability, it's still, we are all working on so much, uh, you know, so uh, such large project, like we have Circular Cleveland, we have a grant from Robert Wood Johnson Foundation, which is getting started now. So there are so many wasted efforts and how can we as city and government maximize our personal resources um, and, if we, uh, at the end of it, once we submit the certification process, we will eventually put together a report. Is there any way to add the SDG vocabulary inside in the report? You know, so I was uh, work, uh, talking to Hillary from USGBC and they have the report on SDG alignment. Similarly, I found the World Future Council report on renewable energy. So there is some interest because of personal interest. You know, I, I was trying to bring together those alignment into the presentations or, you know, just so that we can add that vocabulary and introduce that in our co process of community engagement. But if there are any uh, uh, best practices or any efforts that could come, and if there are any other cities which are going through the same work, not repeat it separately, but include it and minimize our efforts. Because if I present it even to the chief as a separate reporting, I'm definitely not going to get any buy-in. So how can we maximize our time and effort is what I'm here to learn. Thank you. That, um, that uh, what you're saying resonates with one of the comments that I was thinking of making about, you know, what's possible here and what the challenges are. And then after doing work with it, this kind of um, planning around the world, when you go to your local communities, if they've already finished the planning process, the idea of reopening that box and redoing it is really overwhelming. And I think um, when we think about, you know, the planning, monitoring, implementation cycles, right now, this framework is a bit stronger on monitoring. So we lean toward metrics. There's, there's 67, there was recently a meta analysis. There are 67 different sets of me metrics, indices like the SDGs right now. So I think um, strengthening the planning by articulating a method to, you know, if you already have a plan, 
there's still a way to align it with the SDGs if you're starting planning or if you're reviewing so that people can feel they can get in the water, even if they've just finished their planning process. Otherwise, they're saying, see you in five years, we just finished our planning cycle without realizing that it can be pretty easy because you're implicitly doing it. Um, so if you can frame that kind of review without making it sound like it's a, a test where they're gonna look like they missed something, perhaps, uh, perhaps it's a way to say, look, we have an SDG review process that can help you to you know, reduce error or, um, or see, possible, um, see possible synergies that it could be sort of an optimizing process and I didn't get in that way might be one strategy. But I, I do think if you don't hit it at the right part in the cycle, people are afraid of the repetition and I can't even get five minutes with my mayor to tell them I have another new idea when we just branded our strategic plan. So um, what you're saying, you know, kind of resonates with the experience that I had. Others are probably having thoughts and someone who hasn't spoken yet want to share um, what's working, what could be better, what's missing, what's possible. The other thing that we forgot to ask. Well, there's a regional development organization, Minnesota, that adopted the SDGs as their North Star a few years ago. And one of the things that moved them was their board and staff together being part of a Canadian Council yeah, Foundations thing, but also the mapping that they've just uh, completed you know, in, a, in a very rural area with 500 and some organizations doing elements of SDGs. You go, once you have that kind of data with a strong SRE background and you know, be able to map missing pieces and stuff like that, you know, it, it's guiding their economic development work and they're the economic development agency for the region. So um, it's, uh, you know, all of these things could be studied or be replicable, but the main thing is that they begin to add up to positive action at a time where it's felt like COVID plus trouble in Washington has, you know, dominated a lot of the media. So figuring out how to use it also to lift people's hearts and spirits, that's been, I think the main reason our statewide SDG roundtable has grown is that mm -hmm. people like to hear good news. But, and Mark, to your point though, there's also this common language, right? So, you know, Anna, what she's doing with the Economic Development Institution, you know, they're sort of a regional economic development slash community foundation. We're talking universities to cities. It brings, uh, it, it sort of can span different kinds of, of sectors. June, I saw you uh, wanting to come in as well. Oh, yeah, I was just gonna kind of, you know, talk from a business school perspective that uh, how um, SDG kind of um, helped us was um, we're doing this thing called social venture planning competition. And, and uh, from a business school kind of standpoint, you know, social enterprise has been something that's, that's a solvable uh, uh strategy for these issues in a business capitalism way um, and uh, what we have done is that you know we, we every year we have this social venture planning competition and and students um, go out and seek for um, uh, social issues social or environmental issues based on SDGs um, and and look for what categories they can solve and and come up with a, a, a business plan that can um, not only create values, uh, financial values, but also at the same time solving um, social issues as well, social or environmental issues. And um, eventually um, community uh, can actually engage. Uh, local venture capitalists oftentimes are invited to do the, uh, the be a judge. And they also have some, some kind of provide some seed money for the next step. So, so it's kind of, um, uh, the, the SDG framework has given us, uh, given students to find priorities on, on all these issues um, and, um, and, and, and help them kind of provide a framework to also the audience, the community in this case, um, venture capitalists, you know, why is this an important issue? Um, so um, yeah, that's what we're doing. It's, um, 
it's it's interesting, but um, at the same time, the challenge is because we are a small um, liberal art college, so um, oftentimes we do face um, a lot of constraints in terms of getting uh, you know local local cities attention or um, uh, one thing that I'm hoping to get from from these meetings are you know having connections with like um, Christoph um, you know, UW is is like our uh, ivory tower in, in Seattle so hope to kind of get um, local universities engaged together to kind of work on these issues um, together because we're 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 a small liberal arts so we we do want to have you know um, we, we can't solve everything by ourselves so we do want uh, collaboration with other institutions and, and universities and cities that's so an interesting question about having universities collaborate with the city. So, the word collaboration between universities reminded me of the word competition between universities. Has anybody had that kind of dynamic and any ideas about how to how to work together in good faith when it's so hard because we're also people are competing for grants and so forth? Go ahead, David. David, you seem to have your hand up. Well, I could give an example that, I mean, I would, uh, I would say, I would ask the Epic N, uh, Gavin, to sort of talk about what they do as, as a version of that. I would give a very specific example, which I put in the chat, uh, which is uh, maybe a little, I think it's pretty unusual, but like the city of New York started a program called Town and Gown about 10 years ago that actually has a, a 15, it's a model where essentially there, there's a collaboration between a number of academic institutions and the city that includes both collaboration and then a contracting mechanism where we compete with each other for specific grants, but we collaborate with the city around sort of helping the, uh, helping each side, the academic side, the town and the gown side kind of understand what each other's needs and capacities are really before the, the request for proposal go out for work to be done, so. So Gavin, you wanna come in and then we have Gordon as well. Yeah, just, just really quickly, uh, the Epic N model is essentially what, what I talked about, um, creating that structure from the university side. Um, and, you know, we work pretty cooperatively between each other. In fact, there have been some times when I've not been able to match a project with our university. And then I actually asked a colleague from another university um, to, to take on that project. And given that we're in pandemic world, you know, it doesn't matter if the students are 50 miles away or 3,000 miles away. Um, and then I also wanted to say that our, our university year program um, kind of with with goodwill, we try to reach out whenever we're working with a community that has another nearby university. And we just say, hey, we've been approached to do some work. We'd love to include you and find ways to plug your faculty in. And I think that just, I don't know, that kind of goodwill goes a long way. And people are usually really happy that you reached out to them and they're not thinking competitively. Um, and in fact, Lori, you and Joel and I know that we just worked on a, a joint grant with about eight other institutions of higher education. And they kind of, uh, I mean, there, there are some weird like competitive undertones to like, like who's the guy, who's the woman in charge and everything like that. But um, it certainly seems like more and more funding organizations are kind of requiring or, or asking for these kind of inter-institutional partnerships. So we had a lot to gain from working with other universities. But again, I mean, you know, the competition thing is, is there, but I'll hand it off to Gordon. Thanks, Gavin. Uh, I think just a, a few reflections on what's been said so far. First, um, I, I agree with what everyone is saying. The onus really is on us, I think, to articulate what the value added is, to, to, use, um, to use Tony's words, what's the value added of moving to an SDG framework for local governance on these challenges. And, and I, I do think we need to articulate that very clearly and come up with good case studies, not just of jurisdictions that have adopted the, the, the SDGs, but then what benefit came from doing that. Otherwise, we're just suggesting that these bureaucrats do a whole bunch of work for no clear benefit. Um, here in San Diego, I've tried to articulate it in two ways that have been 
quite successful. This is also a place that had lots of other indicator systems, uh, lots of other plans. But, but I think what was really resonating was first that this is a data rich environment where institutionally there's been investment in setting up data systems. But nevertheless, that ends up in very disconnected policy processes. We have the city and the county have groups thinking about homelessness and health and climate change and housing and congestion. All is completely separate processes working on different data, working on different action plans. And that the SDGs setting up a unified framework where you're looking at all these targets at the same time on a single geospatially resolute dashboard forces these cross-cutting conversations to happen. And the moment you said that, everyone in the city government and the county government says, well, of course, we know that that's true and that we know that this is the direction we need to move in. And, and the fact that it's, it's a framework that already lets us get there is, is a big selling point. Secondly, it's taking advantage of the economies of scale by the fact that you have so many other cities that have moved in this direction, not only in the US, but globally and setting up things like open source platforms and SDG dashboards and, and borrowing from what are the budgetary processes that Mannheim and Malmo and, uh, and Aloha Plus in Hawaii, that I think lends, you know, we don't have to reinvent the wheel in all of these jurisdictions to solve these complicated and cross-cutting problems when we can uh, when we can adopt these global frameworks. And so that's, I think, the, the sales pitch that I've been using, and it's been quite, quite successful here, but, but I think it'll have to be tailored to, um, to uh, opinions and preferences locally around the country. Secondly, on the university competition, you know, I think that the, the SDGs are so broad and complicated that there's plenty of work for everybody to do. Here in San Diego, it was really easy to see what everybody's comparative advantage is. It just becomes immediately clear. Uh, so in the case of UC San Diego, we're an R1 institution where our folks tend to be thinking about problems at the global scale. Uh, and then we've got other excellent universities where the comparative advantage quite clearly is to have people who've been working on city level and local level politics and processes and analyses for decades. And so coming together around supporting the, the governments regionally for decarbonization, the modeling expertise and the connections to global processes and the best science kind of naturally sits in one place where the engineering is stronger and the systems analysis is stronger, but then where there's very, very little actually knowledge or interest in what a local jurisdiction of 20,000 people actually is doing and has been doing for the last 15 years. Meanwhile, another group at another university has been advising local government on, on environmental issues for, for, for a decade or two. And so just teaming up becomes a very automatic, very fluid uh, and very productive process from, from everyone's point of view and it, and it happened quite naturally. Yeah, thank, thank, thanks, Gordon. And, and the one point I would really, from, uh, from the cities that we work with through the city, through the community of practice that we've developed, which is global in nature, I, I, would, I would really emphasize Gordon's point on the value, uh, not just being sort of adopting the framework, but then what's the behavior change or the policy intervention or the value that's come out of doing that? What's the What's the change in procurement policy or the way in which budgeting works or a, key, a couple of key policy interventions that bring more co-benefits across different areas of development. Um, and so the more that you can do that, and I think universities are really well positioned to be able to not only help cities and communities identify those and take them further, but then also show what the impact is, right? Take, take that data away and, and actually create the case that says, here's what the impact has been of, of actually approaching the problem in this multi-dimensional way and the SDGs having helped you provide the, the framework for doing that. And I think the value added is not just were you effective, but did the SDGs help you be more effective than without them? And I think it's the interconnection and holism that has been alluded to when people are saying this gave a clear framework we want to organize a school around this. I mean, there's there's something here about and the convergent science. All of these things are are reaching toward um, toward the same thing and kind of a practical way of seeing the connections um, and integrating specialized focused work with interconnected work. So, something. Uh, Mark, Mark, are you hoping to say something? I. Oh, I oh, you know, I, uh, there, I think you uh, were. Muted. I love all these examples. You know, they make me so happy. To, yeah. More examples. I think I think we're building momentum, and more examples. There'll be a point where um, where 
you know, you hit that tipping point um, of getting to your 10% adoption or whatever. And um, the mayor yesterday was so inspiring. I think if most mayors heard that talk, they'd be very eager to work regionally. I, I love the way he talked about thinking regionally as a mayor of one place. And that yeah. is something that I think, you know, will be also really appealing as a value proposition. Especially you have a rural urban divide like we do in Wisconsin and many others do. Yeah, yeah. And I'm glad he was connecting to the Appalachian. Yeah, it was awesome. You yeah. know, side of that in the Appalachian, um, uh, in Berea, there's a promise zone that's connected with the promise zone in North Minneapolis. Mm -hmm. There's like a little film about it and stuff. And I mean, you know. Yeah, you're doing it too. I, I heard in the breakout, I, I referred to the other one because everyone heard that, but it sounds like Minnesota also has tons of momentum here. So. Yeah, it's, it's, for right now, it's, it's really good. And part of it came because uh, the mayor of Los Angeles, uh, contracted or something with the Occidental to be their SDG advisor. Oh yeah, I saw that. And, yeah. and they sent it out to all their alumni around the country say, hey, come down for homecoming week and meet the mayor. And, and the Occidental people here in Minnesota, there are a couple of them are on the UNA uh, association board with me. They were so horrified that their college was sending this out and that they, you know, there was no action here that they went and they went and got on like Hamlin and three or four others and really, but I mean, it was, it was, you know, an email to yeah. alumni that motivated people. And, well, you know, that happened. network is gonna lead that to happen. I wanna yeah. thank um, Tony for being with us because he has to leave early. I'm gonna do the outlet, um, the, the readout and give people a chance to add. If you add, make it brief in case someone else wants to add, but I kind of have a list and it's been great to be together. I want to give one more chance. If anyone who hasn't spoken wants to share no. something, please, please do. Um, we'll probably be zapped into the other world at some point because it's two thirty-three. But we can we can keep the conversation going um, until then. So. Mark, could you say that that email was not accidentally sent to the? Uh... <laughs> The no, alumni. you know, sorry, sorry, I had a, to. It was such no, but go for... to love alumni. Uh, I mean, I love reading alumni magazines because alumni associations know how to brag on their uh, colleges. And in terms of this, goes at some something about rankings and metrics that I think is useful. When you have we we have a county health rankings that started in Wisconsin. It's all over now. And I, I just hated the idea of rankings because why can't you just give them a score? Well, the rankings get this constructive competition going if you use them well. And so, you know, we want to keep up with peer, keeping up motivates people more than staying ahead in some ways. And I think that's also something to think about as a motivator when we're framing these things, you know, kind of everyone else is doing it um, type thing or the leaders are doing this. It does, it does people make the risk averse stop and say, okay, you know, I'm risk averse. I want to make sure I'm not uh, missing doing this. So, hey, Lori, I don't know if you saw. They're not gonna. They're not gonna take us out of this room. Oh, we okay. actually have to leave here and then. Oh, join we the have other to room. leave. Okay, let's all go join the other meeting. Nice meeting you. You know how to Bye, find. Everyone. You know how to find each other. Bye.